we can have the conversation and then hopefully we'll achieve quorum at some point. If not, then I think we need to take it to, I mean, we can do a straw poll, you know, here and, yep. but then maybe take it to email. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so mm -hmm. quick, uh, update, uh, no real update on Hackfest planning, but, um, we are still, uh, assuming that Chicago is going to work September 21st and 22nd, just finalizing some details there, hoping to have that completely locked down very soon, but just in final discussions there. Uh, Europe, if you haven't submitted your um, preferred date patterns for that, uh, for the final Hackfest of the year, please go into the Doodle Bowl and do so at your earliest convenience. I, I don't think I've done the Europe one yet. Did Was location... In, uh, specified or mentioned? Nope, it wasn't. Um, we're really just looking for uh, uh, broad date patterns that work best for folks, so then we can dive into location from there. Yeah. And if there are preferred okay. locations, or if anyone has venue space in those, uh, definitely reach out to us uh, as soon as well, possible. Well, there was, uh, from an IBM side of things, uh, I know that the team in Zurich was interested, maybe, Yep, and I'm chatting with them already. Okay. All right, that's all on Hackfest, unless anyone has questions there. For a uh, backup to your Chicago, uh, I've already do a thread just a few minutes ago where we're looking at some space in Minneapolis. Um, so if you're pretty far down the road with Chicago, then that might not be relevant, but uh, hoping to provide another option there. Cool. And, you know, this time or not, we're always looking for future locations. So um, whether as a backup, you know, for September or ongoing, it's it's good nonetheless. Minneapolis in September is way better than Minneapolis in January. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of really I'm one of the only months that, that you really want to be here. <laughs> I'm just going to put that one out there. <laughs> <clears throat> Unless, of course, it's Jackson Hole. That's a different story altogether. <laughs> okay. Plus All one right. on that. <clears throat> okay. Um, then uh, are we all good with the, the Hackfest discussion then? All right. Let's um, transition back to the conversation we left off last week regarding the, um, <clears throat> the annual TSC election process. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the process aside, which is the dates and, you know, the, the voting, uh, uh, you know, using the Condorcet uh, approach and so forth, that's basically not something that we can, um, uh, that, that we can change. But there was, you know, I think there was some legitimate um, discussion last week and, um, uh, you know, that the approach of just counting people that have landed a commit here or there or everywhere. Um, oh, yes. Can somebody put the, Todd, the link to the uh, process yep. draft that yep. Tracy put out? One second. Thanks. <clears throat> um, so, so the process aside, I think, you know, the, uh, the conversation last week was, hey, uh, you know, in terms of the list that Tracy had compiled of people that had landed a commit, there were an awful lot of people who have been making uh, very valuable contributions to Hyperledger um, from the technical side of things. And, um, you know, their, their, their contributions weren't uh, reflected or, you know, weren't being considered. And, you know, uh, for, for those who weren't on the call last week, again, last year, we went through a similar um, uh, discussion and we uh, basically said that the work group uh, participation and again, active participation in a work group, meaning some contribution of some sort, whether it's editing, uh, you know, the white paper or proposing and editing a uh, requirement and a, a use case or um, uh, you know, presenting to the architecture or identity groups and so forth, that those, you know, material types of contributions, uh, as well as uh, chairing a working group, would, uh, would count towards uh, the voting uh, <clears throat> eligibility. 
um, and as well as the you know, you know the ability to run for the TSC itself. So um, uh, you know we had a further email discussion uh, at the end of last week, and I think over the weekend I I put out a proposal. I think this was the only proposal. Um, if somebody else put one out and I missed it, or um, you know, please uh, please speak up and uh, post a link into the into the chat. But I, I think I had one of the um, the last emails, and 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 I put out a, a sort of a formal proposal, um, which is in the uh, <clears throat> pardon me in the agenda. It, it's uh, copied into the agenda here. Um, basically, and I hate this stupid go to meeting thing. Go away, so I can read. Um, that in addition to the GitHub Garrett committer data for the preceding 12 months, that we would, um, uh, and the project maintainers, that we would also include the list of workgroup chairs, and then from each of the workgroup chairs, collect a list of contributors, uh, again, sort of based on the, the criteria that I outlined before of active contrib contribution, some, some, something that involved um, some sort of contribution. Um, and, and then that would be, uh, we, we would add to that a, a dispute resolution process. So if somebody felt that they weren't included in the, the final tally, um, that they could appeal to the work group chair, remind them what they had done, and the technical advocate, um, I think we just have one right now, so that's Tracy. Um, and then the, the final determination we left to the staff to decide whether or not to include the individual who's disputing <clears throat> their um, uh, exclusion, if you will, from the list of voters. Uh, and so I'd like to put that up for discussion and, you know, we can amend this and we can augment it or whatever, but I'd like to just sort of put that out there for a uh, discussion and, um, and the, I don't know if we've achieved quorum yet, but um, certainly we can have a discussion and maybe take a straw poll if we aren't at quorum. We've not reached quorum unless uh, she had her maker here. So I think it looks good. I I would I would like to hear from Vipin. I don't know if he's on, but he's the one who brought it up. I thought it was a good point he raised, and I think this proposal addresses it, at least to my understanding. So, and just to clarify, Chris, I mean we have only one list, right? The list is both the people who have the right to be nominated and the people who actually have the right to vote. Yeah, there's only one list. Yeah. That you this know about. <laughs> and this is Mark. I, I'm in favor. Of <laughs> so, any any other thoughts? <clears throat> yeah, Mark Wagner. I'm in favor of it. I like it. Um, does anybody not like it? And I mean anybody, it doesn't have to be a TSC member. All right, well that was, it wasn't hard. <laughs> um, Hart was just bringing up an interesting point in chat. Oh, I'm sorry, and I pushed all that out of the way so I didn't see it. Hold on, how do I? So what he's uh, suggesting is similar to the work group chairs being able to uh, add names that uh, maintainers of project be able to add names. That one is probably going to be a little harder for uh, that whole appeal process, though, because um, like I'm not sure that I would be able to properly judge whether or not somebody who appeals and says, well, I should be part of Sawtooth's contributor list, even though I haven't contributed anything, um, because I, I, I'm not aware of that kind of conversations, right? Hey, so unless, uh, there, unless those conversations are public, where I can see that somebody is actually like doing design documents or something like that, it, it's gonna be a hard judge to say, uh, well, they appealed in 
yes, they should, or no, they shouldn't. So uh, I was wondering what what the motivation for this would be. I mean, at at the project level like this, where it's around a repo, typically, you know, code or documentation is what it's all about. So I I am trying to understand, is that to meant to catch the case of like what Mick was saying, somebody who works in the back and feeds the developers with information such as algorithm and whatnot? So, you know, I, I actually did have a follow-up conversation with Mick about this um, uh, in email, um, and it's unfortunately he's not here. But um, you know, there's I, I think you know there's a there's a valid statement that you know some people contribute sort of indirectly, um, you know, by virtue of helping to write a spec or what have you, um, and uh, you know, and then that gets translated into code. Um, and I, I think that, you know, again, if there is a spec, maybe it should be published and then it's really part of the code, right? Um, uh, you know, you can, you can trace it right back uh, to something that's, 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 you know, that's measurable, that's objective. I think the subjective, oh, so-and-so has contributed um, you know, I think as Tracy said, well, I could just, I could name a bunch of people, I suppose, and, you know, but their contributions are not directly measurable, and so then it's just really my word against everybody else's. Um, and I think that, again, it's not hard to actually make a meaningful contribution, whether through a working group or, um, <clears throat> you know, contributing to the editing of a spec or something like that um, that gets posted in a wiki or in the in the code base, uh, I think that counts, right? Um, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, as I said in my note, that unfortunately the wiki itself is really crappy about um, tra uh, tracing who's edited. Um, it really only shows you the last edit. I suppose in the back end, there's probably some way of figuring out, you know, the actual log of edits and so forth, but media wiki, uh, it's just crap, sorry. Um, but um, certainly, you know, from a from a code perspective, um, you know, specs are they're fair game as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, if there is a back end spec, then maybe it should be part of the the code base, um, or at least tracked in the wiki for the project. The wiki does actually will show you per page and and across the wiki recent <clears throat> it, recent changes yes, as far as changes to each page. It doesn't so show you, it, right, but it doesn't show you all of them, Brian. Yeah, it does. Um, uh, on a page, it shows you the old revisions. And we can get that from it, and it's not media wiki. Anyways, um, uh, it, that's that's I don't think changes in the wiki are one of the challenges here. I couldn't find a way of getting them. Maybe yeah, it's like the maybe revisions. You yeah, when you click on that, you get recent. You don't get the whole list. Oh. Anyway. And I take it, Todd, we're still Chupacabara. <laughs> About. <laughs> uh, we're, uh, we're, we're not a still. Yeah, it's still uh, not a cool No, but I think, I think the job process as it is encapsulates um, sufficient to be voted on. And I think it's uh, what Trace has done here by including the double three contributors that allow the list of voters to be. Um, uh, reflected of two contributors or active contributors to the project as opposed to just the code base. So I think that is good. Yeah. Because design, strategy, architecture, all these make up are uh, success factors for any good project. So hopefully um, this draft of process will get passed. Looks good to me.
All right. Well, then, Todd, I guess we should just tee this up for uh, an email uh, vote. Will do. I'll, I'll send that right after the call. All right. Thank you. Uh, next up is the uh, survey. Tracy, you want to pick this one up? Yeah. So, um, and uh, Catherine's on the line as well. So, Catherine uh, kind of approached me and wanted to run a survey to find out more about the developers. Um, she was thinking about focusing it on the Hyperledger Composer in that community, um, but thought that maybe we would, might want to expand that to uh, to the entire community, and which is a great idea. So uh, I'll just you know give kudos to Catherine right off the bat. Um, the idea really is to find out more about who is part of the Hyperledger community, so that we can better serve them, right? Uh, make sure that we're providing the right sorts of uh, tools and infrastructure and uh, that things are actually working for them. So um, as you've seen, uh, I've put out just a draft of, of kind of the survey of what we're thinking about. And um, yeah, I, I, I really just, I, I think it's important that we understand who's part of the community and the diversity of our com community and uh, really help to, to make sure that they are getting what they need out of us. Thanks, Tracy. So, uh, Catherine, do you have anything to add? No, I think Tracy's Tracy's really captured it. I think it helps us not just um, from for the technical community, but also for how we get the word out about the projects that we're working on. And as we get to the next um, iterations of each of these projects make sure we're kind of going in the right direction. So um, I'm really, I, I think this is a great opportunity to really learn a lot more about um, kind of who's using it and how we can serve them better. So thanks Tracy for all your help on this. I really appreciate it. Thanks. So yeah, my only comment was on the first question, which was the, um, uh, the, the question about um, sexual Gender. orientation and it just seemed so out of place because there were no other um, sort of no other questions like that about you know whether it's uh, ethnicity or age or um, you know whether you're a crotchety old man or whatever. But um, <laughs> we don't have any of those, do we, Chris? <laughs> what? <laughs> I think I qualify. <laughs> um, uh and it, it so it just sort of stuck out i think if we had the, the others I, I i i i appreciate and i understand you know the the point about wanting to understand diversity that i think that's important um but it's because it was the only one and it was the first one it just sort of like i said it just sort of stuck out so which other ones should we add should we have uh race there as well um uh, certainly or you know uh if if, if not that then uh, location right where are you right are you in china india there's pakistan so india? there is a location uh, question yeah, there is a country and city so there is a country okay do you um, want to ask about why age not, why not ethnicity uh, what what, like what are the objectives what are the objectives of, of the survey I mean, you know, community normally is set up by uh, volunteer and people go there and do things mostly anonymously uh, to contribute. But, you know, why Why would we want to know age and race and genders and location and all of that? Well, we want to understand the diversity of the community as much as we want to understand. I mean, from both the, the, the technical questions we're asking, but also, you know, who our community is about. And it is a it is a, a priority to try to understand um, from at the very least from the gender uh, perspective that has been brought up to us um, by by members of the governing board, as well as by by journalists and others. Um, and it is a, a, a certainly a hot topic in our industry. Um, so, so that's that's why it did stick out as the question to ask. Um, I, I think adding one or two others around, you know, age diversity and, and ethnicity might might be appropriate as well. Um, and you know, if it helps it stick out less, that's fine. 
Um, and, and, but this you could is, also add in an opt out if people don't want to answer demographic questions. They don't have to. That's another possibility. So, so the demographic question, questions, yeah, none of the demographic questions are required. I, I made sure that those were not a required um, sort of thing, so that if people were not interested in providing that information, they could skip them. So, um, well, for a sake of planet, I think we need a complete list because data is king and analytics and, and the use of that data is very important. However, some of these attributes can be optional. Um, we have to decide which ones are optional. A, for example, could be optional, it doesn't matter how old the contributor is as long as they contribute. Um, but race, you know, is one of these things that I think statistically and from an analytical perspective sometimes is important to have. So, but some of them can be optional. Maybe having a little introduction as to why we are even asking that would help. Because when you explain what you just said, it's a hot topic in our industry. We're trying to find out you know, diversity in our community. It makes it a bit more you know, or less surprising at least. So maybe if that were in the survey, then people would understand why we're asking and feel more comfortable. Well, because the other, the, the other end of this spectrum is that, you know, once we collect this information and if people voluntarily provide information, how would we protect this kind of information and so on and so forth, right? This is an, uh, an anonymous survey is yeah. an important thing. Um, and it, yeah, and you, you have to be careful about not asking too many questions that may make it easy uh -huh. to un de anonymize but um, being anonymous, uh, uh, okay. I think there's some protection there. It's one reason to ask fewer rather than more questions. Right, okay. Um, just a quick question here. If the governing board really wants to know the uh, kind of the diversity metrics, can we get them to tell us what they want to know? Because that seems like the, the easiest thing to do here. <clears throat> I can say that the, the, the one specific thing that they brought up is gender diversity. They haven't brought up diversity in other ways. Right, but that's with regards to contributions, yes? With regards to the community. Yeah. Oh, community, contributions of all sorts, sure. Right. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm not clear on who the survey will be targeted to, now that you yeah. mentioned that. This is, this is active contributors, or this is just anybody who's using the code? Yeah. I mean, you know, the, an, another comment that I have here is this. Uh, I, I think it's okay with me for the survey to be anonymous and hyperledger community as a whole, because at the beginning, someone mentioned, either Tracy or Catherine mentioned that, you know, we are going to take the survey first and target the uh, composer project. Uh, I'm very leery of that, you know, as, as, as we start to get, you know, surveys uh, into a narrow uh, project, like composer, like fabric, like sawtooth legs, uh, we start getting this kind of, you know, information that we start, you know, it's not good for the community in saying that, uh, you know, composer is more diverse than than fabric, more, yeah. you know, and sawtooth, yeah. things like that, that I, I don't like to see it surface up and people start. Ben, I think Tracy, ben, Tracy and I agree with you. Uh, Tracy and I, I think, are, are absolutely on the same page as you. Really what we're trying to get is, an overall sense we sort of i'll admit we started with composer but as we thought about the hyperledger community more broadly we thought we want to target really anyone that's touching hyperledger to understand who that is so you know probably most interested in developers because they are a lot of who is interacting and building both uh, contributing to the code and building on top of it but there are obviously a whole host of um, people from you know different roles including marketing legal and just getting a sense of what that broad community is like, I think would be really helpful um, for a variety of different initiatives. So, you know, as we as we go, it's meant to really be as inclusive as possible. There are some specific questions around what is your role? How are you connected to Hyperledger? And I think that'll give us hopefully a snapshot of, you know, where we are at this point in 2017 with the community. And the, the most important part is just driving people to respond to it. And so making sure that we get it in the right channels, that we get you know, a decent sample size. Because I think that's 
more than anything, that's important. If we only have the people, you know, the 26 people on this call respond, we're going to have a very skewed perspective versus if we're able to get, you know, the broader community that has a couple hundred people. Um, I think that's potentially, you know, a compelling story for, for, the, for the Linux Foundation, for Hyperledger, and for everyone that's working on this. Who, who's, who are we soliciting to participate in the survey? So in terms of the channel that Tracy and I have talked about, um, we thought we would put it on the Hyperledger website. And Tracy, correct me if there's anything um, I missed. Rocket Chat, uh, the mailing list. And then we thought, and then we really wanted to solicit your perspective in terms of other channels that we should use to, uh, to get this out to the community. I think um, the uh, the mailing list doesn't necessarily capture everybody. Brian doesn't. Kevin, keep a list of all the the contacts. Maybe we should share it with all the member contacts. Yeah, I mean we can certainly share it with the with the commercial with the sponsoring members of Hyperledger. Uh, I think the developers are uh, just as relevant too. Well, I mean, but if we shared it with them, then they and asked them to share it with their their teams or whatever. And then, uh, what would be a complete definition of community? Would that include the corporations out there internationally who come to make use of um, hyperledger fabric, as opposed to our more uh, internal community of contributors plus? Uh, you might say the the more direct organization that you develop hyperledger with to open source. I think the survey was written with developers in mind, um, and I think the the heart and soul of the community is the developer community. Um, the sponsors are important, um, and uh, the non technical working groups are growing in importance, um, and I'd like to include them. Uh, but uh, as as in the in the bucket of contributors, which is why we've you know included them in the in the vote, for example. I think it's roughly the the same list. I mean, for me, it's it's it, there's some synonymousness there <laughs> uh, between uh, um, the previous conversation and this one, um, which is uh, uh, yeah, I think we are kind of defining um, you, you know with a little more crispness who who the developer community is, who the who the hyperledger community is, and that's that's not a bad thing at all. Um, but I, I, I guess I guess I take that particular view. That's a perfect Yeah, and I think I think that's why we were thinking about things like Rocket Chat and the mailing list, right? Is because there are there are a lot of people on Rocket Chat who are trying to use our, our different projects, right? And trying to understand them and um, you know, I, I think they deserve a voice in this as well as the people who are contributing source code, right? It's the people who are spending time with your projects and, and trying to um, use them. I don't think we should overthink this one because it's completely voluntary in the first place. So all the people with privacy and security concerns should not take the survey, of course. But it's a choice. And it's anonymous. It's an anonymous too. The most important thing. You know, um, uh, Hart is here talking about linkability, which, I mean, you know, of course, uh, anybody can read uh, whatever he has said on these chat windows if they care to look at the... Uh... So uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the point is that we are all participating uh, in a kind of a semi-public way. Uh, the recordings of all these conversations are available, uh, you know, there's video from all kinds of, uh, you know, the meetups available. So I don't, I don't think we should overthink this. I think it should be just, you know, instead of debating this to death, we should really uh, say, okay, this is a survey. Uh, the sample size is important. We'll uh, publicize it through all channels. Let's look at the results. Let's promote it. 
I agree with you, Vipin. My my point about the the introduction to the first question, the gender is, uh, you know, I would be worried that people start looking into the survey, look at this question, and say, what the hell is this, and they just shut it down because they don't want to have anything to do with this. So I, you know, I thought that explaining a little bit why we have been asking this would get them over that and say, if you don't feel comfortable, feel free to skip that, and then. You just avoid people from being turned off right off the bat. So I think from a structure perspective, we can put that at the end of the survey, so it's not the opening. We can put in a quick, like, this is why we're asking these questions, and if you prefer not to disclose, check this box, and you don't have to answer. And yeah. hopefully that gives, that that doesn't turn people off from the start. Hopefully get some good information. And then for those that are concerned, they don't have to respond. Uh, that's a good idea. That's great. Okay. Do you guys have any specific or strong opinions on things like timing or other channels that we should consider? Okay, I'm going to take that as a no. So great. Out in the if, middle of summer. That... Yeah, I think I would. Sorry, I was just coming off mute. I would. I would think Catherine and Tracy, or maybe Brian, or you know, somebody could post a, a blog and say, hey, we're trying to figure out who our audience is and who our community is. And we'd like you to just as another me, because some people just subscribe to the blog. Great idea. Yeah, we can do that. And Tracy, maybe once you get back from vacation, we can get this up and going. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Right, so cool. OK. Thanks, guys. Really so appreciate on a, your time on, a, on this. Yeah, on a loosely related uh, item, the uh, on on Rocket Chat, I and mean, we were just talking about uh, understanding who we're we're reaching and and so forth. I'm a little uncomfortable with the uh, anonymity or, or pseudo anonymity out on Rocket Chat. I think it would be easier to understand or, or better or kind of transparency if we had um, email addresses visible in the the profile of each participant there. I actually agree with you, Dan. I find that a pain. It is just, I, you know, it's not clear to me whether it's intentional or not, but people, you know, it looks like people are hiding, even though I don't think that's necessarily what they mean to. And it's sometimes a pain to figure out who am I talking to here? <laughs> right. What's the detriment to supporting anonymity in the chat? I mean, what, what problems does it cause other than a minor annoyance of, I don't know who this person is? Well, there's there's probably a few things. I know some people uh, are probably on there with some kind of agenda that would be more clear. I think it's also more clear as a, uh, if somebody is taking a position on one of the projects, it's more clear if they're actually associated with the project, if there's some other uh, weekly identifiable facet there, like their email? So uh, I'm going to push back on this one only because from a security perspective, anonymity tends to be a very important aspect um, for people who are coming to us saying, hey, I think I've found a bug or I think I found a, you know, a, a security vulnerability. Um, a lot of security researchers like to carefully maintain their anonymity. Um, for many reasons. And I would also argue that knowing who they are, it, it doesn't really matter if they have an agenda, agenda, I guess, you know, or it doesn't matter if you know who they are and they have an agenda. I, I, sorry, I'm trying to explain here, like, it, it's okay if someone comes into an open source project with an agenda, right? Yeah, I, um, I think it's okay. Whether they're anonymous or not. Or transparent. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I have a question for Brian here. Um, Brian, from a strategic um, direction, what is the rationale, as you say, for collecting this sort of community-based data? How is it going to be used or used um, by, you might say, the executives? Is it the executive or could you explain a little more so we get a feel for how that information is going to be used? And therefore, if it's more strategy and direction, then it's it's important that we have the survey and just make certain, I said, 
parameters is optional um, as we see fit. I'm, I'm sorry, were you asking about the strategy for the, um, the this, this question around anonymity of rocket chatter around the survey? In the survey and the community, yeah. What is the rationale for selecting that data um, from a strategic perspective, if there is one? So the survey is to better understand ourselves and to ask, are there, uh, I, I mean, this was, this was something that wasn't, isn't being driven top down. This is something that um, I, you know, what some of our participants are, are leading and saying that they want to see, right? So, um, uh, but I think we can, it's not easy to answer questions about, um, you know, the diversity question, the distribution of interest across different languages, the distribution across the world uh, of the contributor pool. I can answer the question about distribution of geogra geography from our sponsoring members, but I can't answer that about our developers unless we actually ask the question, right? So um, it's not it's not hard to understand. Um, and if somebody were to say, hey, there's a diversity issue, without without meaningful numbers, we can't either actually respond or or if we try to, you know, make a change to improve that number, um, there's no way to, to objectively measure that um, I, uh, without something like this, right? So uh, this it's it's not very controversial that that organizations or communities would want to ask themselves a set of questions like this. Um, uh, issues around confidentiality of the data and, uh, you know, mitigating bias and other things certainly much more relevant and I'm happy to see those issues brought up here. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but hopefully the, the, the need for something like this is uh, self-evident. So returning quickly to the, the rocket chat thing, I, I appreciate Dave's viewpoint on providing anonymity. Op, uh, options. I think that there's probably enough ways to get uh, email addresses that if somebody really wants to hide their identity, they can. But we'd basically be putting a small burden in front of somebody who felt that they needed to be anonymous there. And, and that might still make a little bit of a difference to us that, that if most people uh, aren't trying to work around that, that we have better sense of, of who's actually communicating on rocket chat and then the other aspect being that I think everybody has to provide an email address in order to get a Linux Foundation ID so they're not anonymous to the Linux Foundation that is the point uh, Dan that uh, that I agree with Dave that on the on the first uh, in the on the face of it they you know, people should be anonymous, but if they engage in egregious conduct, like trolling and talking, uh, you know, talking shit, basically, then they should be uh, unmasked. And uh, there's, or kicked out even, because it depends on what what they what they do. But if they're uh, just engaged in day-to-day uh, -day activities and they're contributing you know, they have the uh, option of remaining uh, anonymous. And I support Dave here. Yeah, if someone really wants to be anonymous on this, then you're going to log into Tor. You're going to like run Tor browser. You're going to create your email account and Linux Foundation ID through Tor. And then you're going to start signing up and doing everything. Um, so, so, you know, even if you just, um, if you just sign up directly from your home computer and use a Linux foundation, you know, and use just a pseudonym, people are still going to be able to de-anonymize you in theory. Um, I, I guess that was my large, larger point here is like the, the, only benefit that is being proposed here is that, you know, trolls would be unmasked and you know, like, you know, we could try to police our chat to keep trolls out. But as you just pointed out, if someone's intent is to actually troll, they're not going to be so stupid as to log in on anything that's going to allow them to be unmasked. Right. So it's not going to solve the troll problem. And well, it, it creates a problem than somebody who's abusive. Well, 
but even then they're going to and probably use some yeah, anonymity tool. And then then the <laughs> then what you're doing is you're adding a benefit or uh, sorry, adding a barrier to entry that doesn't really result in the benefit you're seeking. Yeah, I, I don't want to suggest that there's even necessarily a troll problem that needs to be addressed. It's 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 something that's less severe than that. It's just it would be nice to have more transparency there. It helps you understand a little bit where somebody is coming from, or uh, be able to understand that the person that's committing out on, or you know submitting a PR or something is the same person that's in in chat. And if somebody wants to avoid any of that, they still have all those mechanisms that, that Hart threw out. Um, so I don't think it necessarily provides a harm if we make the email address visible, uh, but it provides a transparency benefit. Okay. I mean, I would argue just ask them. I mean, if there's a question, ask them. Like, is this you who's submitting this change request? I don't know. I'm sorry, Dan. I I'm very jealously guarding the ability to act anonymously because our entire world is going in the opposite direction. And um, I think it's going to be a big problem in the near future. So um, I, I would uh, like us to would, see uh, us like as an organization supporting anonymous um, action, honestly. And yeah, that's my own sure. personal bias. I'm just going to say that's my own personal bias just because I, I like to be able to be anonymous online. <laughs> I mean, I, okay, well, I, I, I don't want to. Sorry, we'll, we'll probably have one more on this. I don't want to hijack the agenda here. I know we still have the project reporting thing to discuss, but maybe we can take an agenda item for uh, next meeting to maybe finalize a decision on this. So, so Richard, just listening to this debate, I mean, the, 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 the key thought that strikes me in any kind of community, and not, not just the Rocket Chat one here, is I'm actually less concerned about there being a valid email address because that's that, that, that's easy enough to, to spoof when you use a, a personal one and no one really knows who you are but um but um but i do find it an extremely useful heuristic to be able to um correlate contributions over time so knowing that somebody um who's who's commented and you know, in my head built up a reputation as a sensible or or um constructive that when somebody with that same id is commenting later that it's the same person and i can then map that to um to, to pull requests or contributions so provided there's 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 stability of identifier over time and across relevant platforms then then i'm happy but if, if we don't have that then that's a problem for me but if we, if we do then that, that, that's okay for me well, a fairly contentious subject, but I would say it all depends on how the data is to be used. I mean, we are collecting data here. So if having an email address, because this is internal data to the organization of Hyperledger or the Linux Foundation, whichever way you want to look at it, if that data is going to be used for different purposes, um, uh, whether it's for a survey, whether it's to understand, analytically how our contributor environment or community uh, is associated with different types of There's so many use cases you can apply as long as you have the right data. So it may be email addresses shouldn't be synonymous, uh, synonymous. It should be a, a mandatory membership requirement if one is using chat or any other, you might say tools within Hyperledger that the email address is required. So these are all decisions we have to make anyway going forward. And Okay, well, uh, again, thanks for accommodating the segue, everyone, and or the, the side discussion here, and we'll probably get back on the uh, regular agenda. Yep, <clears throat> so the next uh, topic is, and I lost my place here, uh, reporting. So that's Tracy again. Yeah, so uh, regarding the project reporting thread, uh, so last time we talked, I uh, was hoping to get some responses on the thread. Uh, so far, that thread has been silent, uh, and so really want to make sure that we're we're making progress towards uh, allowing the the TSC to understand the state of our projects, uh, whether they're uh, in a healthy state, whether that development is happening in the public, uh, whether development is happening at all, uh, and and so really 
but just, I guess, really call out for if we are going to have a discussion on the mailing list, um, how can we make some forward progress here? <clears throat> so again, you know, going back to the reporting, my, my only feedback was I didn't think that monthly was I mean, unless, again, we can get most of this stuff sort of collected and then we're just adding in some highlights, um, I thought monthly was a bit, a bit much. <clears throat> so if we change that to quarterly, then the, um, the proposal would be acceptable? I think so. And, you know, again, I, I, I do think we have to I mean, I think there's a certain amount of specificity and, you know, the types of metrics that we're looking to collect on, on the projects, <clears throat> but we can work through those. You know, how do we automate those things? Yeah, let me know, Tracy, if you need me to, to reply to the list or if verbally here is fine. I think the only, the only thing I remember sticking out besides the, the frequency that Chris just covered is the, I think one of the first items there was, email addresses and uh, maybe ironically with with my last comments the the email addresses there um, I haven't found those to be a good uh, identifying quality let's say so you know, trying to if we're trying to say that that if you've got 400 e Gmail addresses contributing on a project that means that it's not uh, substant uh, exclusively from a single company that doesn't really tell you that because a lot of those people might be using their Gmail accounts instead of their corporate addresses. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with that, Dan. I mean, certainly, you know, with, I, I try and track, you know, who's contributing to Fabric and I try and disambiguate between people's Gmail addresses and maintain a list of aliases and so forth. But, um, you know, the reality is in open source, a lot of people, when they do contribute, whether they work for, a company like Intel or IBM or Hitachi or anybody else, um, oftentimes they use their personal uh, email account as they contribute either because maybe they're not contributing as a function of their day job and uh, or because they want to carry that, uh, uh, you know, they want to they want to carry that sort of resume with them if they go from one company to another. And so a lot of people in open source tend to uh, value their their personal technical eminence as a, and, and so they, they they tend to sometimes just avoid using their corporate email um, uh, for that reason. And so, um, you know, again, I don't know if we can, uh, you know, I think to the best of our ability, we should try and figure out, you know, uh, how do we how do we sort of know that indeed you know, as you pointed out, that just because we have a bunch of Gmail addresses that they're not all from the same company. Um, but by the same token, I think we do have to respect people's um, uh, choices in that regard. So. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't think there should be a requirement that people submit under a certain kind of email address. Right. It's just, I, that's not a field that I would bother tracking because of those things that you just listed. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we're potentially talking about two different things. Um, we're, we're talking about the up, the project update that uh, I just pasted a link in the chat about, um, which doesn't ask for email addresses. Uh, it does ask for contributor diversity, but that's not like, hey, give me the list of email addresses, right? So uh, on the project updates, what, what I would like to say is, you know, when we started with the TSC, we said we shouldn't have those calls become like just status report calls because that would be boring. And I think we've successfully done that. At the same time, we have maybe gone a bit overboard in that we we do not have much reporting at all, except when something really big happens. And no matter how, how much I would like to be able to follow more of the other projects, 
than fabric that I'm directly involved in. It's hard. And if it wasn't for the uh, Hackfest, where we learn a lot about what's going on in other projects, you know, we wouldn't have much information. So I think it would be nice to find the right balance so that we have some kind of reporting to, you know, to know more about what's going on elsewhere. Okay, so I think we've beaten this horse to death. <laughs> and we're fast approaching end of job here. So um, unless there's any other agenda items, I think we can give people four minutes. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a good day.